Sermon 7 of Meister Eckhart's Sermons, translated by Claude Field. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Outward and Inward Morality. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. The Grace of God. Grace is from God, and works in the depth of the soul whose powers it employs. It is a light which issues forth to do service under the guidance of the Spirit. The divine light permeates the soul, and lifts it above the turmoil of temporal things to rest in God. The soul cannot progress except with the light which God has given it as a nuptial gift. Love works the likeness of God into the soul. The peace, freedom, and blessedness of all souls consist in their abiding in God's will. Towards this union with God for which it is created, the soul strives perpetually. Fire converts wood into its own likeness, and the stronger the wind blows, the greater grows the fire. Now by the fire understand love, and by the wind the Holy Spirit. The stronger the influence of the Holy Spirit, the brighter grows the fire of love. But not all at once, rather gradually as the soul grows. Light causes flowers and plants to grow and bear fruit. In animals it produces life, but in men blessedness. This comes from the grace of God, who uplifts the soul. For if the soul is to grow godlike, it must be lifted above itself. To produce real moral freedom, God's grace and man's will must cooperate. As God is the prime mover of nature, so also he creates free impulses towards himself and to all good things. Grace renders the will free that it may do everything with God's help, working with grace as with an instrument which belongs to it. So the will arrives at freedom through love, nay, becomes itself love, for love unites with God. All true morality, inward and outward, is comprehended in love for love is the foundation of all the commandments. All outward morality must be built upon this basis, not on self-interest. As long as man loves something else than God, or outside God, he is not free, because he has not to love. Therefore there is no inner freedom which does not manifest itself in works of love. True freedom is the government of nature in and outside man through God, Freedom is essential existence unaffected by creatures. But love often begins with fear. Fear is the approach to love. Fear is like the awl which draws the shoemaker's thread through the leather. As for outward works, they are ordained for this purpose that the outward man may be directed to God. But the inner work, the work of God in the soul, is the chief matter. When a man finds this within himself, he can let go externals. No law is given to the righteous, because he fulfills the law inwardly, and bears it in himself, for the least thing done by God is better than all the work of creatures. But this is intended for those who are enlightened by God and the Holy Scriptures. But here on earth man never attains to being unaffected by external things. There never was a saint so great as to be immovable. I can never arrive at a state when discord shall be as pleasing to my ears as harmony. Some people wish to do without good works. I say, this cannot be. As soon as the disciples received the Holy Ghost, they began to work. When Mary sat at the feet of our Lord, that was her school time. But afterwards, when Christ went to heaven, and she received the Holy Spirit, she began to serve and was a handmaid of the disciples. When saints become saints, they begin to work, and so gather to the refuge of everlasting safety. How can a man abide in love when he does not keep God's commands which issue forth from love? How can the inner man be born in God when the outer man abides not in the following of Christ, in self-mortification and in suffering? For there is no being born of God except through Christ. 
Love is the fulfilling of all commands. Therefore, however much man strives to reach this freedom, the body can never quite attain thereto, and must be ever in conflict. Seeing that good works are the witness of the Holy Ghost, man can never do without them. The aim of man is not outward holiness by works, but life in God. Yet this last expresses itself in works of love. Outward as well as inward morality helps to form the idea of true Christian freedom. We are right to lay stress on inwardness, but in this world there is no inwardness without an outward expression. If we regard the soul as the formative principle of the body, and God as the formative principle of the soul, we have a profounder principle of ethics than is found in pantheism. The fundamental thought of this system is the real distinction between God and the world, together with their real inseparability, for only really distinct elements can interpenetrate each other. The inner work is first of all the work of God's grace in the depth of the soul which subsequently distributes itself among the faculties of the soul, in that of reason appearing as belief, in that of will as love, and in that of desire as hope. When the divine light penetrates the soul, it is united with God as light with light. This is the light of faith. Faith bears the soul to heights unreachable by her natural senses and faculties. As the peculiar faculty of the eye is to see form and color, and of the ear to hear sweet tones and voices, so is aspiration peculiar to the soul. To relax from ceaseless aspiration is sin. This energy of aspiration directed to and grasping God as far as is possible for the creature, is called hope, which is also a divine virtue. Through this faculty the soul acquires such great confidence that she deems nothing in the divine nature beyond her reach. The third faculty is the inward will, which, always turned to God like a face, absorbs to itself love from God. According to the diverse directions in which redemptive grace through the Holy Spirit is imparted to the different faculties of men, it finds corresponding expression as one of the Spirit's seven gifts. This impartation constitutes man's spiritual birth, which brings him out of sin into a state of grace, while natural birth makes him a sinner. As God can only be seen by his own light, so he can only be loved by his own love. The merely natural man is incapable of this, because nature by itself is incapable of responding to the divine love and is confined within its own circle. Therefore it is necessary for grace, which is a simple supernatural power, to elevate the natural faculties to union in God above the merely temporal objects of existence. The possibility of love to God is grounded in the relative likeness between man and God. If the soul is to reach its moral goal, i.e. God-likeness, it must become inwardly like God through grace, and a spiritual birth which is the spring of true morality. The inner work that man has to do is the practical realization of grace. Without this all outward work is ineffectual for salvation. Virtue is never mere virtue. It is either from God, or through God, or in God. All the soul's works which are to inherit an everlasting recompense must be carried on in God. They are rewarded by Him in proportion as they are carried on in Him, for the soul is an instrument of God whereby He carries on His work. The essence of morality is inwardness, the intensity of will from which it springs, and the nobleness of the aim for which it is practiced. When a good work is done by a man, he is free of it, and through that freedom is liker and nearer to his original than he was before. 
The moral task of man is a process of spiritualization. All creatures are go-betweens, and we are placed in time that by diligence and spiritual business we may grow liker and nearer to God. The aim of man is beyond the temporal, in the serene region of the everlasting present. In this sense the new birth of man is the focus towards which all creation strives, because man is the image of God after the likeness of which the world is created. All time strives towards eternity or the timeless now, out of which it issued at creation. The merely temporal life in itself is a negation of real being, because it depends on itself and not on the deepest foundation of life. Therefore also natural love is cramped, finite, and defective. It must through grace be lifted to the highest sphere of existence, and attain to freedom outside the narrow confines of the natural. Thereby love becomes real love, because only that is real which is comprehended and loved in its essence. Only by grace man comes from the temporal and transitory to be one with God. This lifting of manifoldness to unity is the supreme aim of ethics. By this the divine birth is completed on the side of man. This passage from nothingness to real being, this quitting of oneself is a birth accompanied by pain, for by it natural love is excluded. All grief except grief for sin comes from love of the world. In God is neither sorrow nor grief nor trouble. Wouldst thou be free from all grief and trouble? Abide and walk in God, and to God alone. As long as love of the creature is in us, pain cannot cease. This is the chief significance of the suffering of Christ for us, that we cast all our grief into the ocean of his suffering. If thou sufferest only regarding thyself, from whatever cause it may be, that suffering causes grief to thee, and is hard to bear. But if thou sufferest regarding God and him alone, that suffering is not grievous, nor hard to bear, because God bears the load. The love of the cross must swallow up our personal grief. Whoso does not suffer from love, for him sorrow is sorrow and grievous to bear. But whoso suffers from love he sorrows not, and his suffering is fruitful in God. Therefore is sorrow so noble. He who sorrows most is the noblest. Now no mortal sorrow was like the sorrow which Christ bore. Therefore he is far nobler than any man. Verily, were there anything nobler than sorrow, God would have redeemed man thereby. Sorrow is the root of all virtue. Through the higher love, the whole life of man is to be elevated from temporal selfishness to the spring of all love, to God. Man will again be master over nature by abiding in God and lifting her up to God. End of Sermon 7 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico End of Meister Eckhart's Sermons First time translated into English by Meister Eckhart. Translated by Claude Field.